Like most years, 1989 was a very interesting year. It was the last year of Ronald Reagan's presidency. It was also the year that Mikhail Gorbachev was elected the very first president of the Soviet Union. In fact, it was the first election held in Russia since 1917. 1989 was also the year that Land Rover started building this, the Discovery, or as we call it here, the LR4. For the past 23 years, the Discovery has been perhaps the ultimate seven-passenger hardcore off-road vehicle. It's got center and rear locking differentials, full air suspension, and the ability to really go anywhere and do anything. It's just a great off-road vehicle. In fact, it's been so successful that they've built a million of them. And this truck, it really does have everything. Seven seats, five off-road settings, four-wheel air suspension, three sunroofs, two different ranges for the gears. I mean, it's got everything you need to go on an exploration, an expedition. But the thing is, who uses all that stuff? I mean, yeah, 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 you talk to Land Rover and 102% of their clients run the Paris Dakar Rally every other weekend. But I don't think that's really true. In fact, I think most people never utilize the functionality of this truck. Look, here we are in the middle of absolute nowhere and the road surface is smooth as glass. The truck's not even breaking a sweat. If only there was some place we could take it, some place on Earth where we could utilize some of its capability. Obviously, I'm standing in front of St. Basil's Cathedral here in Red Square in Moscow. Why? Well, to celebrate the building of their one millionth discovery, Land Rover has put together an expedition called the Journey of Discovery. And they've invited us to take part of the Russian leg, which is the longest single part of the journey. Normally on Epic Drives, we like to have something to drive. Today's show is different because Earlier when we landed in Moscow, the Russian custom officials got a little upset over a missing piece of equipment, and they detained us for four hours, which was long enough so that we missed our connecting flight to Belgorod. Good news is, we've managed to find a hotel with hot and cold running brown water, and tomorrow morning, Land Rover Russia is gonna pick us up and take us down to a town called Chern to meet up with the rest of the expedition. Even better, we're gonna get to check out a Soviet-era car museum. Sounds cool to me. Anyways, I can't wait to get on the road. we meet up with the four vehicles that make up the Journey to Discovery expedition. But we had a little snow driving to do first. So here we are in the middle of a snowfield, 200 miles south of Moscow, in the middle of a Soviet car graveyard. Now, I'm a big fan of Soviet cars. I even brought my Soviet car encyclopedia all the way from California. The problem we're having, as you can see, is this is an open air museum. And the problem with the cars is the badges have all rusted off. So I'm pretty sure that's a Moscovich, but I don't know what type. Check out the patina on this baby. This is a Zafiret 965, or a Zaz. It's kind of the Soviet version of a Mini. Very cool, rear engine, tiny little motor. What a neat little car. So I'm 
I'm sitting inside of a Zaz 968A. It's sort of the Soviet version of an old rear engine NSU. Again, very small little car, totally weird offset pedals, but if you think about it, it's got everything you need. You have your four-speed manual, you have a clock, an ashtray, and I guess this is how you start it. So really all the comforts of home. So now I'm standing between two Moscovich 401s. Not only were these early Moscoviches, but these were early people's car. This was like after the Second World War, if you weren't a member of the Politburo, you would get a little something like this. As you can see, they're very tiny, and I know little about them other than that they do have suicide rear doors. So I'm here with an Raz van. As my book says, not very well known outside of the Soviet Union. I don't think it's particularly well known inside the Soviet Union, but you can think of it as your uh, run of the mill Soviet party bus. But I wanna show you a really cool feature. It's, it's inside. And uh, just open this door 198 degrees. The engine compartment is here so that uh, when, not if, when it breaks down and it's a nice uh, warm March day like today, you can go ahead and replace a belt or pop rivet, whatever you need to. Sadly, this one doesn't have an engine, but if it did, we could work on it while staying relatively warm inside the cabin. While I wore the wrong shoes, didn't see a big rectangular Zill limousine, and was a little disappointed at the uniform sameness of the cars, the outdoor Soviet museum was still a high point of the trip. I can't say the same for the place we'd visit tomorrow. Here we are in front of our hotel. No, over here, guys. Here we are in front of our hotel in Tula, Russia, the ancestral home of Tolstoy. As you can see, it's a balmy 0.9 degrees centigrade and tomorrow is the first day of spring. Anyways, we're about to press on. We're heading to a gingerbread factory for some reason. We're in Tula, Russia, and they make gingerbread here. In fact, they made us some special Land Rover gingerbreads to celebrate this big uh, cross-continental thing we're doing. Um, this is reputed to be the best gingerbread in all of Russia, and uh, I had a bite, and I hope I don't start an international incident, but... I, for one, was happy to leave Tula and the gingerbread factory behind and get on the road to Moscow. So here we are parked at the Kremlin, and they're making us stay in our cars. We're not exactly sure why, but we think we're gonna get let out for a tour. Perhaps the most breathtaking Russian experience we had were the Kremlin's grand palaces off the beaten tourist path, and definitely invitation only. The opulence is breathtaking, and especially when compared to the stark and nearly impoverished life we witnessed in the countryside. You begin to understand how, in 1917, a revolution rose up 
and Tsar Nicholas II, who lived there, wound up in a ditch. Hello, I'm Andres Liepa. I was born in Russia in 1962. I live in this apartment for all my life. The most unexpected part of the trip was when former Bolshoi ballet star Andres Lipa welcomed us into his home. Gracious and fascinating, Andres provided key insight into what life was like under the latter part of the Soviet system. Two years I worked in ABT when Bershnikov was director. Uh, I was the first who got the official permissions from uh, Soviet government to become a part of the American Ballet Theater. So since Brezhnikov and other dancers had defected, had you, had you thought about it, had you considered it, or just never? I never thought that I'm uh, ready to miss my country and my relatives, because uh, before you had to leave forever. Uh, all the people who defected before, they all thought that they're defecting forever. Not Baryshnikov, not Makarva, not uh, Nureyev. They thought that they could come back. Ever. And that's, you're asking me you now if I ever thought about that. I never thought about that because I didn't want to miss my, uh, my mom, my father, and my sister. Because that, at that moment, they became uh, enemies of the country. And right. they, they were not sure. allowed to even to be close. And people who were around uh, uh, Europe or America, they were just not allowed to talk to them. It was really, you know, at that time, it was, everything was so unusual. You would want to come and shoot in my apartment. <laughs> I would have need to call people in my work, but they were like KGB people to get a uh, permission that you could come. Uh, I don't need it to announce to you, but I would need to uh, tell who is coming. Uh, if I am allowed to take you to my apartment, and what I allowed to say, that was necessary to do. We've driven about a hundred miles outside of Moscow to this beautiful monastery, but we're not going in there. We're here for this truck. It's a 1976 Zill, former military communications truck, which has been converted into a Russian sauna. I'm not particularly keen on going inside, especially on camera. Reason being, pick up any issue of, say, Cosmo, and you get past the 170 new sex techniques that'll drive your man wild. There's always uh, an article about the five things women find least attractive in men. Fat, bald, poor hygiene, Nazism, and worst of all, the most unattractive, hairy back. However, the jerks with the cameras are insisting I go in and we came all the way to Russia, so I've got to do it. Wish me luck. I must say, despite my misgivings, that the sauna truck was actually quite nice. Refreshing, even. I think the big reason why was the funny little sauna hat that Nikolai had me wear. While I'm sure it's made from 100% asbestos, it did keep my head cool while I sat inside that old zill. So we're driving in a Russian spec Discovery. They went ahead and uh, chose this one because it was easier to get in and out of countries like Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan and into Russia itself from the Ukraine. They didn't go with diesel because the quality of the diesel fuel in places like Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan is pretty lousy. One nice thing is because these aren't the diesels because they're the gas engines and they have the five liter V8 with 385 horsepower that's shared with uh, Jaguar, these cars have a lot of pickup, and you need it when you're fighting for position here in Moscow because it's sort of every car for themselves. And trying to maintain a four-car uh, flotilla like this is it's challenging, but it's fun. I mean, if you like driving, you would like driving in Moscow. Okay, we are in a scrum, 
and we're on some major, I mean, this has to be 12 lanes wide. Look at the size of this. And this is just insane. Lennon just rolled over in his tomb because I just drove the one millionth Land Rover Discovery onto Red Square. We toss around the word epic a lot, but I think you can see this is pretty epic. It's an awesome feeling. I mean, I'm going off the script because there is no script for something like this. The scale and the grandeur, it's, it's almost beyond description. You have to come here and see this. Considered not only the center point of Moscow, but of all Russia, Red Square has long been a focal point of Russian life. All of Moscow's roads radiate out from it, and it is quite literally where politics and business meet, though they're separated by a few hundred feet of cobblestones. So St. Basil's Cathedral. It was commissioned in 1555 by Ivan the Terrible and completed in 1561, where it stood as Moscow's tallest building until they built this bell tower across the street. It was then secularized by Stalin in 1929, and today it remains a state-controlled building. I gotta tell you, it's a pretty awesome feeling to be standing here in the middle of Red Square. This is when I was a kid, this is where the million soldiers and the tanks and those giant trucks with the missiles trucked by in front of Brezhnev and later Gorbachev, and it's just very indescribable to be here with all these cars and all these people, and I don't know, it's, it, the words are failing me right now, which is a pretty bad thing for a writer. It's hard to believe this is the place where we used to point all of our missiles. Not only did the West win the Cold War, so did the Russian people. It is just after 4 p.m on Friday and uh, we left Moscow at 7.30 and we've been driving south on this very, very rough, very busted, mostly one lane road, two lane road. We've covered over 650 kilometers. We have 342 kilometers to go of our 600 mile journey to Volgograd. I gotta say these discoveries, even though they're, they're pretty heavy, they're, they're, they're soaking it up. It's not, it's not much of a problem. And I'm glad we're in them with their air suspension as opposed to pretty much anything else. Uh, I think it would be even more uncomfortable than it is. I just didn't know what to expect. You know, Russia is one of those places I've always wanted to visit. I've been an avid fan of Soviet history, but also to a lesser extent Russian history for a long time. And I knew I'd like Moscow, but I wasn't prepared for how much I, I loved it. It's got the the vibe and the grit of New York, and it's got the, the, the architecture and kind of the, the sexiness of Paris, but it's the size of Los Angeles. It just goes on and on and on forever. And all I know is I didn't spend enough time there, and I'm definitely, definitely going back. By road from London to Singapore, more than 18,000 miles by Land Rover, the Oxford and Cambridge Far Eastern Expedition set up a new record. And not only a record of enormous distances, but of a journey through every kind of terrain that Europe, the Middle East and Asia could offer. Normal 86-inch wheelbase Land Rover station wagons painted dark blue and light blue in friendly rivalry, with 50-gallon extra fuel tanks built in. Smooth going on the German autobahn between Stuttgart and Munich road surfaces they will look back on with envy long before they have left behind the soil of Europe. In Greece, for instance, east of Salonika, and still well within the boundaries of Europe, the Land Rovers and their crews already have a taste of rough riding under a hot sun. 
onward from Damascus for the 600-mile desert crossing to Baghdad. And for company, one of the incredibly tough Nairn buses, which follow the pipeline route from Syria to the capital city of Iraq. The Land Rovers are loaded aboard country boats to make the crossing and drift a little downstream till they come to a road on the far side. The road that will carry them on towards Darjeeling and Burma. Bridges, once built to take an army but now rotting, must be tested inch by inch before being entrusted with the Oxford and Cambridge Land Rovers. Not all the bridges have stood the test of time on this unused road. No wonder it takes a couple of hours to travel 15 miles. Still following lonely, dusty, treacherous highways which would break the hearts of a good many modern vehicles. Here, the Land Rovers met their first elephant bridge, which is something of a special driving test, requiring not only a good eye, but an iron nerve. From the picking up of the escort in Malaya, the journey down to Singapore itself begins to take on the semblance of a triumph, a true triumph of friendly rivals. In Singapore, they get the welcome they deserve as the first motorists to have driven across this great overland route. A journey which was a triumph for rover engineering. These sturdy Oxford and Cambridge vehicles were examined by the rover organization on their return and it was found that the engines were still perfectly sound in every respect. Not a bit the worse for this toughest of endurance tests. 18,000 miles, London to Singapore. <laughs>